everybody. Today on JM on Cars, we're going back to the 80s with this, the Lotus Turbo Esprit. When making these videos, one of the things I really pride myself on is being as objective as I possibly can. No matter what it is that somebody's thrown me the keys to, I want to give you an honest and impartial answer as to whether it's actually a car you might want to buy. However, I have to confess, today that's all gone out of the window and I am about to indulge in a possibly unhealthy dose of rampant fangirlism. You see, I have been lusting after one of these for a very, very long time. And yes, long-term viewers of the channel will know that my ultimate dream supercar has always been the Ferrari F355. However, there are a great number of reasons why this, the Turbo Esprit, has always run it a very close second. Chief amongst which were the fact that, for an awfully long time, a 355 seemed unattainable. Even when they were at their lowest, they were still 30, 40, 50 thousand pounds, and that was simply an amount of money I could never imagine having. Meanwhile, these could be picked up for about 15 thousand pounds, which seemed far, far more doable. And there were, in fact, at least two separate occasions where I went to buy a Turbo Esprit and had the money to do so, but it didn't work out. In one case, I made an appointment to go and see the car and was told it was being prepped, so could I come back about two weeks later? And two weeks later, it was still being prepped. So I figured that probably wasn't a car that I wanted and it was in the wrong color and everything else. And on the other occasion, the dealer decided that if I couldn't promise him that I was ready to part with money on that very day, he couldn't be bothered to get the car out of the garage and let me test drive it. And as I don't buy anything that I haven't driven, I politely said, thanks, but no thanks. And spent the next sort of, well, eight or nine years wondering just how good that car would have been. This was all pre-YouTube, and thanks to the lovely and slightly crazy life I now lead, I have had the pleasure of driving a number of other Esprits, including a V8, a later Turbo, and an S2, which in many ways is kind of like this, but without a Turbo. Not quite, but close enough. So, for those not so familiar with the brand or the model, a quick primer. And the funny thing about the Esprit I've always thought is that it's easiest to explain it to people in terms of movies. The first Esprit debuted back in 1976, styled by Giorgiaro, it was an instant hit and falls really into the same category as other 70s wedges such as the Lamborghini Countach. It featured the traditional Lotus construction of a steel backbone chassis on which they placed that fabulous fiberglass body. Power came courtesy of a mid-mounted Lotus designed and built 2 litre naturally aspirated 4 cylinder making about 160 horsepower. Though even in period, the cylinder count and power figures weren't quite befitting a supercar with their 4 and 160 playing Ferraris 8 and 250. Lotus naturally claimed that the lightweight construction of the car, which weighed in at under a tonne, did go some way to offset this. And I'm sure there's a bit of truth to that, but in the world of the supercar, bragging rights do matter. But in any case, the Esprit's place in history was sealed not by its performance figures, but instead its starring role in the James Bond film The Spy Who Loved Me, which came out a year later in 1977 and made as much of a star of the Esprit as Roger Moore or Barbara Back. Today's Dream Drive is sponsored by the good people at Car Vertical, and it's really important when buying a classic like this that you use a comprehensive history check like theirs to make sure the car you're after is what it claims to be. Something like an Esprit may have been around the world, and Car Vertical's detailed checks will help you find out if the car has experienced anything from crash damage to clocking or outstanding finance, even if it's happened abroad. Their service works in just 60 seconds and needs either a registration or a VIN number. Even better, for 10% off, don't forget to use my discount code JM. Lotus, though, were not a company to rest on their laurels. And remember, this was from a time when they were dominating the Formula One scene. And so they wanted to have a flagship road car to match the prestige they'd acquired on the track. And in 1980, it arrived. 
dubbed the Turbo Esprit, not Esprit Turbo, that confusingly is the later cars. It featured a 2.2 litre version of the Lotus four cylinder, but now with forced induction, bringing the power up to 210 horses and torque to 200 pound foot. That's about 270 newton meters. Weight did increase, but even so, at 1,250 kilos, it still remained considerably lighter than the Ferrari equivalent. It is worth pointing out, and Lotus Anoraks wouldn't forgive me if I didn't, that the very first of the Turbo Esprits, which featured a dry sump engine and compromotive four stud wheels, were actually badged as an Essex Esprit, or Essex Turbo Esprit, designed to match the livery of the then current Lotus Formula One team and their sponsor, Essex Petroleum. They are very distinctive, featuring Essex blue paintwork, which is a stunning shade, and a bright coloured and chrome stripe down the side with big Essex branding, and inside, a red leather interior much like this one, which is also fantastic. Perhaps the coolest bit of those cars though, and a very rare option on the early Turbo Esprits, was the roof-mounted Panasonic stereo, which I'm very glad to say this car actually has. And though it is totally, completely, awfully terrible to try and use, it's an ergonomic disaster, it is also just achingly awesome in that very, very typical 1980s way. I love it. But yet again, this is a car best remembered by people for its appearance in a Bond film. In this case, the 1981 For Your Eyes Only, which actually featured two Turbo Esprits. First off, a sadly short-lived white car, much like this, and then later, a copper fire example, which famously had a pair of skis attached to the back that um, meant you couldn't actually open the boot. But uh, movie magic kind of got around that problem. Over the years, the model did evolve, as you'd expect, finally becoming the Turbo Esprit HC. Then, in 1988, it underwent a thorough overhaul and was replaced with the car now known as the Stevens Esprit, featuring all-new bodywork and, again, best known to people as the car in either Pretty Woman or Basic Instinct. Somehow, the car soldiered on until about 2003, undergoing another redesign and eventually acquiring the V8 power it really always deserved. But unfortunately, in typical Lotus tradition, they also made a bit of a mess of, and today it's the four-cylinder cars, particularly those with forced induction, or the very early S1s, which are the most highly prized. So, that's a little bit of a primer, but what is it about this car that makes me love it so much? First off, the looks. It is iconic. Yes, I love the F355, but if you compare the side profile of that and this, they're pretty similar. I think this car has a lot of odd, awkward angles where it looks very, very dated, but there are also a few where it's just pure perfection. And that side profile is one of them. For me also, it has to be an early car in either this Grand Prix white, not the Pearl Essen, with the black, non-color-coded bumpers, red graphics, and preferably the red interior. If I'm being honest, this is just about my perfect Esprit. And sadly, I know that it's uh, not for sale, nor really are there any others out there like it. I also have to admit that I am a little bit of a sucker for cars with graphics on, and uh, the Turbo Esprit decals on this for me are some of the coolest out there, along with the uh, 944 Turbo's big turbo badging on the front wing. So cool, so 80s. I feel like I should get a perm just to be able to drive this. No, you don't, Pidgey, don't you dare. The interior is also pretty dramatic. I love the kind of wrap-around dash here, which gives you just about all the gauges you would need. In fact, uh, volts over here, we've got oil pressure, revs, and uh, there was a gauge in the middle I was panicking about because it's at naught, but I realized that is turbo pressure. Then you've got to the right of that speed, water temperature, and finally fuel, of which we've had to put a little bit in this morning. The car has two tanks, and uh, if you don't open both of the filler flaps, it can um, cause a few issues. On that front, by the way, one of the reasons that I did never, ever buy an Esprit back in the day was that I knew, though I could have afforded to buy one, running it is a whole different matter. The fact is that a car like this is going to be just as expensive to run as a 355 or something like that, maybe even more so. The parts are probably going to be cheaper for this, but the labour may be higher because, well, it is a 70s car and doing stuff on it is not the easiest. Case in point, this car currently doesn't really want to go into reverse too easily, so I'm having to do a few unusual turns and things like that to sort of avoid getting stuck in a kind of compromising position. But you know what? Stuff like that doesn't bother me, nor does the fact that the pedals are impossibly close together. I've worn a special footwear for today. No, 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 no. None of it matters. Because, you see, 
this is one of the very, very few cars that I've idolised for decades, really, that when it's come to it, hasn't been a disappointment. Allow me to demonstrate. It's sublime, this thing. Right, where do we start? Well, the engine, because that was the selling point. That's why they put the turbo bit first and then Esprit later. It's good. Yes, there's lag, sometimes a fair bit of it, but it's also got punch. Makes some nice noises too. You lift off, you get a little flutter like that. <laughs> That's cool. That being said, once the engine has spooled up, you've got a nice even spread of power from about 2,500 RPM all the way to about six. It's a very tractable engine, this. And in fact, between three and 4,000, I wager it's pulling much harder than the equivalent Ferrari would have been. The gearbox also, reverse aside, is actually fairly decent. It is, as with all of these cars, taken from a Citroen of the time. I think a Citroen Maserati, potentially. It's got five speeds and it does a fairly decent job. There was never an automatic option available for these cars and honestly, that's just as well because an auto gearbox of the day, well, would have killed this stone dead. The brakes are also pretty decent, easy to modulate. The pedals on the light side, but very nice and progressive. They are discs all round, though notably inboards at the back. But of course, this being a Lotus, you know the highlight has to be the handling. And the Turbo Esprit is no different. It's sublime, this thing. There is no power assistance for the wheel, nor was it available, or to be entirely honest, necessary. Even at low speeds, the car is not that heavy. The front wheels are fairly narrow, 195 sections. The rears are a little bit wider, and so it's really not an issue. It is also just wonderfully, beautifully communicative. I'm doing 30, well, 35 mile an hour, something like that at the minute. And you can sense everything. Now, this isn't the best steering in the world ever. No, 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 no. That award goes to this car's predecessor, the Lotus Europa, the weird odd bread van shaped thing from the sort of 1960s and 70s. But that, to be honest, is a very, very strange car that although I really, really, really enjoy driving, I've never wanted to own. This is quite different. A lust for the Esprit. And to get in it and find out that it is good to drive is just, it's not the icing on the cake, it's the cake under the icing. How many times have you looked at a gorgeous, amazing, brilliant cake? My parents bought me a chocky wocky doodah cake for my birthday once because I've been going on about them as to how I want this amazing birthday cake. I always get, you know, a normal supermarket cake, although Colin the Caterpillar is amazing and I will have not a bad word said about Colin. But I got this chocky wocky doodah creation and um, it was awful. It was just awful. It looked fantastic, it looked sensational, but it tasted awful, it tasted dry had the same flavour and texture as this bit of road. Very, very disappointing. The Esprit then I thought might have been the same. Iconic looks, you know, it's a fantastic thing. And in its day, it was a genuine Ferrari rival, but its day was a long time ago. No, 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 no. You can have a lot of fun with this car. Visibility is pretty good too, provided that you're looking forward. And actually those louvers at the back, which come on, are amazing. Don't even impede your rearward visibility either. Oh, I should actually mention, one of my favorite things about the Turbo Esprit. Those louvers at the back, that really prominent little kick on the rear, they look really effective, don't they? They look really aerodynamic. They're not. In fact, when Lotus did test this car, they found out that they um, increased lift. They didn't decrease it. But Colin Chapman loved the way that they looked. And so to counteract it, the Lotus design team introduced just a, a little aerodynamic device of their own, a small little lip molded into the top, just, just back here. And uh, what that does is just completely break up the airflow, meaning that uh, all that stuff at the rear doesn't do anything. <laughs> That's so 1980s supercar. I mean, today, Ferrari would not allow anything to be on a car if it wasn't aerodynamically functional. Speaking of air, this one has had air conditioning retrofitted to it. Apparently there was an issue with the early wet sump cars because on the dry sump cars, which you could have air conditioning for, the aircon compressor went where the sump then had to go for wet sump cars. They, uh, they didn't really know what to do with it. So early ones like this didn't have aircon. It's been retrofitted and uh, it does work. But 
because the car didn't expect to have aircon, at junctions and things, it can stall kind of easily. So uh, I've got it turned off at present. I am told that these are the sort of car that you really, really want to know how to work on if you're going to own one, or be willing to spend a lot of money with a specialist keeping it going. This is why I've not bought one. And the fact that the right one has just never cropped up at the right time. That little bit we've just gone over back there, that's one of my most brutal tests of a car suspension. It's a, a little cutout, a little sort of, you know, I don't know, channel that's been carved into the road for repairs or something, and they've never fixed it. So it's a, a down and up. It's a vicious little thing. Many 4x4s struggle over that. This, this did fine. It's remarkable. It's really, really nicely damped. It's still on the firm side. It's not a sophisticated suspension. Later Ferraris, you know, 355 and so on, much, much cleverer, but they've got adaptive things and all sorts of stuff going on. Actually, to give Lotus credit, they did test a version of the Esprit with a genuine active suspension. There's footage of it online from an old Top Gear or something. Very, very clever system, but uh, ultimately wound up being far, far too expensive for anybody to productionize. And so uh, nobody ever did. Now, like a lot of classic cars, the price of these has risen quite a bit in the last few years. For £15,000, you might just about be able to get one, but it's going to be a project. The beginning of a project. It's going to need a lot of work. And that, in some ways, is how this car's owner, Andy, actually bought this. He's known the car since 1985, when a friend of his bought it, and he at the time also had a Turbo Esprit of his own. That replaced a Europa, and it was followed by an XL. But decades later, he found himself wanting to scratch the Turbo Esprit itch, so bought this car off his friend. But though it had had a lot of maintenance over the years, wasn't neglected, there were still lots and lots of things outstanding. And he tells me it's kind of easier to list the stuff which hasn't been done. In the case of this particular car, that would be taking the body off the chassis. This one has a galvanized item, and so he's had a look at it, and it's OK. But just about everything has been done. Gearbox rebuilt, engine rebuilt, cosmetics done. The whole car's been repainted. The interior is original with this beautiful ruched leather, which I'm told is very, very difficult to recreate. And I've got to say, it actually feels all very, very well put together. This is a car you could do big miles in, and over the last seven years, he's done about 20,000 of them, which he doesn't think is that much, but I think is probably more than many other Esprits have done. So, uh, well done, Andy. I said at the beginning today I was likely going to fangirl over this car, but trying to be a little bit objective, in many ways it is a supercar of its time, today you'd consider it more of a sporty GT. The engine might be in the middle of it, but the ride is still relatively plush, the steering light, the boot fairly spacious, although you won't find much space up front and in the rear it'll cook whatever you put in it, but it would make an excellent classic tourer. Compared to, say, a Ferrari Testarossa and certainly a Lamborghini Countach, this is a car I could see you still putting fairly big miles on without being totally hammered at the end of the day. What is something like this actually worth now? Well, it's really hard to say because so few of them are actually up for sale. There is an example of an Essex car, and those always commanded the most, of the turbos at £125,000. But it's been there for quite a while, and I suspect might be there for quite a while longer. Other non-Essex examples tend to go for anywhere between about thirty and fifty thousand pounds. With the early dry-sumped cars with the four-stud compromotive wheels in place of these five-stud BBSs that actually have been modified a bit, and so look really, really nice, tending to command the highest prices. But I've never really been fussed about that sort of thing. It's my understanding that if the dry sump goes, getting parts can be difficult. So maybe just get the one that you can find and is in good nick. The other thing I do know is that likely the most expensive of all these cars you could buy is the project that needs work and really if I want to buy one of these I probably should buy one that's just just sorted. It's so good this car. You still get a bit of lean in the corners so you know what you're asking of it. The power level feels just about right and the best thing I could possibly say about this car and actually it's true of many an old Lotus is the fact that this is a 40 year old sports car it's old it's designed really in the 70s so the chassis is 50 year old tech it belongs to somebody else i'd really really struggle to replace it if anything happened to it and yet i've got the confidence to put my foot down and enjoy it really enjoy it
this is frustrating because uh, I wanted one anyway. Now I kind of have to have one. One day I shall make it happen. But until then, I'm going to remain grateful for the fact that every now and again I get to sample a little bit of that life. And so, all I think that remains to be said today is a big thank you to Andy for bringing the car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.